general practice, it fits very well and it's an excellent role to have in that environment. And they are using it. And we have got some good examples in Wales now, and I'm sure it's all over the country, where there are sort of commissioned services now using community pharmacy to do things like minor ailments and emergency supplies and this sort of thing. So I think it is taken off. But one thing I was going to ask is I remember I was around the prescribing course in 2006 because I, I think I was involved in Cardiff University then. And there was always, I asked what the difference was between nurses, because the nurses and pharmacists were the two main people, if the only people, weren't they? What's the differences that they describe between pharmacists, prescribers and nurse prescribers, those going into the training? The nurses didn't like the numbers and so they needed extra help with the calculation paper. And the pharmacists didn't like touching people <laughs> so they needed extra help with that. <laughs> Absolutely. And the nurses also didn't particularly like the pharmacology side of things. So actually, it was quite a nice mix in the classroom because they could support each other. Where I teach, we deliver a clinically enhanced pharmacist independent prescribing program, also known as CPIP. It's only for pharmacists. So they do the standard prescribed program with a beautifully wrapped around clinical assessment module that they have to, so they do get to touch patients, they do get to dipstick urine and listen to chests and look in ears and do all sorts of touching and feeling, which they're not used to doing, but actually they're loving it. Um, so we don't teach them to be competent, we are teaching them to be capable. We want them to be able to recognise when they look in someone's ear when something isn't normal and know when to refer. So we were asked to deliver that by NHS England so we developed the programme and um, we've been delivering it for a couple of years now. It's funny you should say that so I work in a practice where we've got all the prescribers we've got a first contact physio we've got a paramedic we've got advanced nurse practitioners and we've got myself we always have this conversation and they refer as do the doctors when it's outside their competence in relation to drugs but I always say I'm barely in inverted commas competent so I'm going to use your new word of capable in relation to diagnostic so you're right I can assess and I I get a, a warning if like actually I need, now need somebody who's more competent than me to distinguish exactly what's going on here so it works well in that sense yes absolutely and of course the new kids on the block of the paramedics so we see more and more paramedics working in general practice and they're very well placed to be prescribers they were turned down back in 2015 when they were trying to become non-medical prescribers but very fortunately the law changed in 2018 and so they've been training alongside the other healthcare professionals in the classroom and uh, doing a very good job of it, so I understand. The Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill.com. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay, Fiona, well, one of the other reasons for coming on the Oral Apothecary is that you could give us your Desert Island drug and a career anthem and a book. So I know you've been listening to some of the previous episodes. So what would you like to give the three apothecaries as your Desert Island drug? So I had a long think about this and... I was going to say HRT because I am a woman of a certain age, um, but um, that's fairly new to me, and so I haven't gone for that. But what I've gone for is paracetamol. So paracetamol, because what an amazing drug. Um, it's followed me since I was born, really, and it will probably continue to be my friend in my pocket until the day I die. It's great for mild to moderate pain. It's cheap. You can buy it from Sainsbury's, Tesco's, any other store will do. Um, there's little, very little, no side effects for most people. You can take it when you're pregnant. You can take it when you're breastfeeding it helps if you've had your covid jab and you're feeling a bit dodgy afterwards you can have it in f Vescent form, tablet form, capsules, oral suspension, suppositories, you name it, you can get it intravenous even. Um, who knew that? I didn't realise you could get it intravenously because I'd left clinical practice some time ago and, and so it took me a while to realise that could happen. And um, if, you're, if you're European, you can have it in a suppository as well. Yeah, she said that rectally. <laughs> France and Greece, very popular. Absolutely. In fact, one of my children, I've got three sons, they're all adults now, was poorly as a little boy, couldn't swallow anything because he was being sick and so I gave him a suppository did the job lovely a little bit unorthodox over here but um, I actually do have a bit of French ancestry so it came into its own at that time and for me I had a knee replacement in December 2019 so while I was in the hospital and this is a big op this is a brutal operation. So um, recovering post-op in the hospital, I had oxycodone. Very lovely. Thank you very much. And they discharged me on gabapentin and tramadol. Now, I have never had such enormous drugs 
ever in my life. And I had no idea, even after teaching prescribing for so many years, I had no idea the effect that they would have on me. For the first night, I remember feeling so ill and so anxious I couldn't sleep. One minute I thought I was having a stroke, then I thought I was having a DVT, then I was having a pulmonary embolism, then I was having a heart attack, and I blame the drugs. I really do blame the drugs, and I'm not even going to start talking to you about the constipation. I gave up on the drugs, and I went to paracetamol, and uh, thank you, paracetamol. So that is my drug of choice, and if I was on a desert island, I'd want plenty of paracetamol. I think that's a great choice, and if and, and anyone who's ever been a parent of young children knows that it's magic. Talking about it being magic, am I right in saying we still don't really know how it works? There's ideas put forward, isn't there, about messengers and pain signals and stuff, but we don't actually know how it works, do we? Which is incredible considering how much we use it. And also, it linked to nurse prescribing, I can remember when supplementary prescribing first came in, and the nurses are pretty certain and that prescriptions for Calpol by the health visitors was the first prescription I ever saw by a nurse. So there we go. Maybe it was you. I also think it's a great choice for those things that you described, Fiona. And I also describe it as the celery of drugs. In other words, it's calorie free. In other words, it does work, but you don't have to worry about any side effects. So that's what I call it, the celery of drugs. Just taking too much. (laughs) So excellent choice. You could definitely have that. What about your career anthem then? Okay, so that that was, again, quite tricky. I'm going to go with, do you remember a band called The The from the 1980s? Okay, so my, my anthem is this is the day ah yeah i like that song yeah i like it in fact i love it and i've been singing it ever since the 1980s and i still play it and i still dance around my kitchen to that song i absolutely love it i can't really say much more about it the lyrics are quite simple but quite a nice message you know this is the day your life will surely change and um I can pretty much say that my my life did change when I did that prescribing program. Did you hear us talking about the book that was suggested, which was called The Crossroads Between... Should and Must. Thank you. Did you hear us talking about that? No. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But it's, it, it, it is a great book, Jamie, I think, and it was uh, Jill Cruikshank that suggested it. But it's that crossroads. It sounds like you were at that crossroads when you decided to leave the NHS and set up your own company, yeah? Yes. I mean, it was a scary time for me. I didn't know if it was going to work or not. But I felt so passionately about non-medical prescribing and I didn't want to leave it behind I'd, I'd learned so much about it and it had become so important to me and there was nothing for me in the NHS to be able to stay and continue with that and I could see that people needed professional development so that's why I decided to just give it a go and see if I could do it myself which I'm just surprised that I do still do it <laughs> all these years later yeah and you're very very successful at it so that's great what about finally then what about a book for the oral apothecary library <laughs> Well, you'll laugh about this, but um, it's a bit of an odd answer as well. But um, the BNF. (laughs) Yay! Somebody had to pick it. Somebody had to pick it. Well, if you look carefully in the BNF, my name is in it. Because I sit on the Nurse Prescribers Advisory Group and the members are listed in the BNF. So I'm really proud of that. (laughs) And of course, every prescriber needs a copy of the BNF in one shape or form, you know, whether it be the book, and uh, goodness knows how long that will still be published as a book form, don't know, um, or the app or, you know, online. Well, that I think that's a great choice. And you know what? It has to last until the 100th edition. Surely that is when they will stop printing it. Well, I got in the post today, I got number 81. There you go. So, and I'll tell you for why, because my dad's a pharmacist and I own, I own number one, I own number 10, I own number 25 with the silver 25, I own number 50 with the gold 50. I was very disappointed that 75 didn't have a special colour, so I'm expecting it to go out all guns blazing. I think it's just before I retire, hopefully, for the 100th edition. That's my view. That's my wish anyway. Well, do you know what? You're nearly as sad as I am because I have every copy of the nurse prescriber's formulary in my cupboard going back to 1998. Well, there you go. We're well put together. Yes, and I I had to get the missing ones from uh, eBay. (laughs) (laughs) So that I've got the whole... I mean, it's ridiculous. No no one else would want it, but... Who was selling them on eBay? 
Well, the medical students get them for free and then sell them on eBay. No, but this is the nurse prescribing formulary. So I've got every copy of that. <laughs> oh, that's genius. I'm sorry, Fiona, but that's going to have to be your book, I'm afraid, for the Oral Apothecary Library, the BNF. We love it. So the micro discussion, we thought, seeing as Fiona was coming on, and you've obviously heard her passion for non-medical prescribing, but we thought we'd talk about the competency framework, which actually first came out in 2012, and I think was just for pharmacists originally, but it has now been adopted. It was changed, I think it was in 2016, the second version came out, and it was endorsed by all Royal Colleges, so nursing medical, paramedic, physio, and all the groups that Fiona's mentioned. But it's really interesting because it's now about all prescribers and it's a competency framework for them and it's been out for consultation again. And so we thought it would just be a good thing to talk about with Fiona given that that's her expertise. But I must just introduce you to this subject by saying I decided to do a straw poll today at my surgery and I asked all prescribers in the building to ask me yes or no if they had ever heard, let alone look at, the prescribing competency for all prescribers. You may not be surprised to hear that all bar one of the non-medical prescribers had seen it and had studied it as part of their course. All of the doctors said they'd never heard of it and never seen it. So Fiona, what do you make of that? Yeah, not surprised at all, but I just need to correct you about its history. So the first framework was published in 2001 by the National Prescribing Centre, who you may remember were very influential in the early days of the development of non-medical prescribing. So um, they produced a framework for nurse prescribers on orange front cover. And then when the pharmacists joined us, they produced one for them with a nice red front cover. Then in 2005, one for the allied health professionals and then a blue one for the optometrists. And then obviously the framework all looked very similar. So in 2012, they put it all together and made this lovely competency framework for all prescribers. And very good it was indeed. But by the time 2014 came for it to be updated, they had merged into NICE the NPC and kind of disappeared so the update didn't happen so the Department of Health asked the Royal Pharmaceutical Society to look at the framework which they did they blew the dust off gave it a little bit of a shake up with some experts and uh, you know this brand new look and quite frankly they've got all the glory for it but they were really bless them love them they were really reinventing the wheel and reviewing what had already been written which is fine it's great and they have been given all the glory the um, the NMC have adopted it as their standards of professional practice, as have the Health and Care Professions Council, and all of the regulators ask that it's used, well, don't ask, it is the standards for the prescribing programme, so it's used as part of the clinical practice. I'm not surprised that many, many doctors don't know of its existence, uh, but it's a shame, but I guess maybe that's marketing. I don't know, who do we blame for that? Is it part of their training that, I mean, it's been around for a number of years, so it's a shame really that the medical schools aren't using it as part of the education for doctors. The doctors who have supported non-medical prescribers through their prescribing programmes should be aware of it, should be quite conversant with it really, but it doesn't surprise me at all that they don't know about it. But I'm sure if they did know about it and if they did get their hands on it, they would find it really useful themselves to self-assess their competency. Maybe just for the listener, we should explain that this has the patient in the middle and it is a circle. So as the patient in the middle and then six of the competencies are about the consultation process i.e assessing the patient finding out information and making a decision shared decision and then prescribing and then the other seven to ten competencies are around your own prescribing governance around prescribing safely professionally within the part of a team so those are the competencies that we're talking about but again going back to my little straw poll one of the relatively newly qualified doctors did actually say to me no but i think maybe i should have a look at it because he said if I'm honest when I started prescribing I started at good old paracetamol worried anything more than paracetamol I was worried about what I was doing and I learned from there upwards. I mean it comes back to your point earlier Fiona uh, you know and when I read that letter out earlier about the sort of uh, the anxieties in the system about what was going to happen as you rightly pointed out the therapeutics and prescribing training for medical undergraduates didn't compare to the prescribing courses that we were then putting on for our new prescribers and so on behalf of the RPS the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, of which I'm a board member, um, Fiona, I accept the glory on behalf of the of the society. <laughs> so that's good. You say they involved a number of ex 
experts, when I was looking at it, I, I couldn't help but count the number of experts in the back. How many experts in the back of this, this 2016 edition? Which There's a new edition coming out this summer. How many experts in the back, do you reckon? Was Fiona Peniston Bird on it? No, no, I wasn't. Give me a number. Uh, 50. Higher. 73. 100. Higher. 200. 125 people acknowledged in the back of this 15-page document. <laughs> So they consulted widely and they, and they had a lot of expertise. I just want to share one story with you. And this is my educational technique, Fiona, for running prescribing sessions with dentists. And I'm going to use a, some moral licensing here where I say some of my best friends are dentists before I, um, before I throw them <laughs> under the bus. I would start with saying, look, if it was me, I would remove prescribing rights from you. And that gets their attention. 